Section 8 of The American Book of the Dog. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lawrence Trask, Mount Vernon, Ohio, InterfaceAudio.com. The American Book of the Dog. G. O. Shields, Editor. Section 8 the deer hound by q van hummel m d in this animal we have the aristocrat of all the canine race he is the best guard the best companion and is capable of giving us more royal sport than any other breed of sporting dogs i say this without fear of successful contradiction a high-bred and properly trained deer hound has more courage and can stand more punishment than any other dog he has stronger attachment for his master or mistress will fight for him or her quicker and more desperately will never forget them and when taken to the field he can run fast enough to catch an antelope a jackrabbit coyote wolf deer or elk and can kill either of them alone and unaided he will tree a mountain lion or a black bear and will even fight a grizzly bear long enough for you to climb a tree or get off a good distance so that you may kill him without danger to yourself these dogs combine more rare good qualities as a gentleman's companion than any other breed in the known world eidstone says of them pet dogs of course are a matter of taste and locality and space must have much to do with the selection of a companionable dog if however size is no objection it would be impossible to name any dog superior to the true deer hound whether employed in his proper vocation or not he is gentle in manners unless roused by the sight of his game and excited to pursue it he is no sheep biter he is a good guard he follows well he can keep up with hack or carriage he is not a self-hunter that is he does not skulk off poaching he is faithful to his master he is gentle with children like the far-famed gellert his prototype and he is majestic in appearance witness the pictures of him by sir edward landseer in every variety of attitude and sharing in all the pleasures ay even the sorrows of his master with the hawk or falcon he made up the equipment of the old baron and slumbered in front of his yule log shared in his wasai and revelry and formed a feature in his pageant and procession he has been the companion of kings and emperors and pulled down his game in the open by dexterity force and speed without the aid of toils or crossbow immaterial to him in old days whether it were boar wolf or hart no day too long no game too strong or dangerous until his eye became dull his limbs stiff and his teeth worn down not so much with years as the hard work exposure and wounds inseparable from his occupation and he was retained at the hall or grange as a pensioner or a companion for the rest of his life he has the grand form the elegant outline the graceful attitudes and amiable disposition of the greyhound but far surpasses him in harmonious color and in texture and quality of coat the writer has had as many as forty deerhounds in his kennel at one time and all have harmonized in color so perfectly as to please the eye of the art connoisseur a number of them may not be all of exactly the same color but they will breed true to a color they may be steel gray lemon or tawny one family that came from imported forum was canary colored and every one proved true to that color not so with any other known breed there is always a strong family resemblance in a strain of deer hounds a dog of good proportions should stand thirty one inches at the shoulder should measure thirty five inches around the chest his forearm should measure from eight and one half to nine and one half inches his weight should be from ninety to one hundred and five pounds he should be compactly built but not too long in the loin this is one of the faults in many deerhounds of the present day when we remember that this dog must have great speed 
must often make immense leaps after his game and when he catches it must have sufficient power to kill it which is often a difficult task we see the necessity of a powerful muscular conformation he must be quick at a turn to avoid the sharp hoof of the stag this requires a short powerful loin and strong quarters the coat should be harsh not wiry about three inches long and there should be a good thick undercoat bristly at the muzzle on shoulders neck and back the outer coat should be coarser than elsewhere the head should be of the greyhound type only stronger somewhat thicker and more powerful the eye should be full intelligent and of dark color the ear should be small coated with fine short silky hair of close texture it should be carried close to the head until the dog is excited when it should stand semi erect the neck should be strong and not too long the greyhound neck cannot be too long because he must reach to the ground to pick up his game but the deerhound if a good killer jumps on his game's neck and hence needs no extra length in his neck but does need extra strength there as elsewhere in order to hold on his shoulders should be oblique and well muscled his back strong and well arched his hind quarters strong and powerfully muscled his stifles should be well bent and his hocks well let down the stem should be large at the watt this denotes a strong spinal column it should taper down gradually to the tip where the bone should be fine it should be well covered with coat and curved upward and sidewise it should be of good length in fact his general build must be on speed lines his feet must be close and high knuckled of the cat-like order here is where the deerhound will first weaken if not properly knit and closely muscled his work in following his game over the rocky cliffs and over fallen timber at full speed is of the most trying kind the writer has often seen the flat or hare-footed deerhound get footsore in a few hours work while the strong-footed dog will work day after day for an entire week and never show distress standard and points of judging in skull value ten the deerhound resembles the large coarse greyhound it being long and moderately wide especially between the ears there is a very slight rise at the eyebrows so as to take off what would otherwise be a straight line from tip of nose to occiput the upper surface is level in both directions nose and jaws value five the jaws should be long and the teeth level and strong nostrils open but not very wide and the end pointed and black cheeks well clothed with muscle but the bone under the eye neither prominent nor hollow ears and eyes value five the ear should be small and thin and carried a trifle higher than those of the smooth greyhound but should turn over at the tips pricked ears are sometimes met with as in the rough greyhound but they are not correct they should be thinly fringed with hair at the edges only that on their surface should be soft and smooth eyes full and dark hazel sometimes by preference blue the neck value ten should be long enough to allow the dog to stoop to the scent at a fast pace but not so long and tapering as the greyhounds it is usually a little thinner than the corresponding part in that dog chest and shoulders value ten the chest is deep rather than wide and in its general formation it resembles that of the greyhound being shaped with great elegance and at the same time so that the shoulders can play freely on its sides the girth of a full-sized dog deerhound should be at least two inches greater than his height often an inch or two more but a round unwieldy chest is not to be desired even if girthing well shoulders long oblique and muscular back and back ribs value ten without a powerful loin a large dog like this cannot sustain the sweeping stride which he possesses and therefore a deep and wide development of muscle filling up the space between wide back ribs and somewhat rugged hips is a desideratum a good loin should measure twenty-five or twenty-six inches in show condition 
the back ribs are often rather shallow but they must be wide or what is called well sprung and the loin should be arched drooping to the root of the tail elbows and stifles value ten if well placed give great liberty of action and the contrary if they are confined by being too close together these points therefore should be carefully examined the elbows must be well let down to give length of the true arm and should be quite straight that is neither turned in nor out the stifles should be wide apart and set well forward to give length of the upper thigh many otherwise well-made deerhounds are very straight in their stifles the high symmetry value ten of this dog is essential to his position as a companionable dog and it is therefore estimated accordingly quality is also to be regarded as of great importance legs and quarters value seven and a half great bone and muscle must go to the formation of these parts and the bones must be well put together at the knees and hocks which should be long and well developed the quarters are deep but seldom wide and there is often a considerable slope to the tail some of the most successful dogs lately exhibited have been nearly straight backed but this shape is not approved of by deer stalkers the feet value seven and a half should be well arched in the toes and cat-like a wide-spreading foot is often met with but they should be specially condemned color and coat value ten the colors most in request are dark blue fawn grizzle and brindle the latter with more or less tint of blue the fawn should have the tips of the ears dark but some otherwise good fawns are pale throughout the grizzle generally has a decided tint of blue in it white is to be avoided either on breast or toes but it should not disqualify a dog the coat value five is coarser on the back than elsewhere and by many good judges it is thought that even on the back it should be intermediate between silk and wool and not the coarse hair often met with and there is no doubt that both kinds of coat are found in some of the best strains the whole body is clothed with a rough coat sometimes amounting to shagginess that of the muzzle is longer in proportion than elsewhere but the moustache should not be wiry and should stand out in regular tufts there should be no approach to feather on the legs as in the setter but their inside should be hairy the tail value five should be long and gently curved without any twist it should be thinly clothed with hair only summary of judging points skull value ten nose and jaws five ears and eyes five neck ten chest and shoulders ten back and back ribs ten elbows and stifles ten symmetry and quality ten legs and quarters seven and a half feet seven and a half color and coat ten tail five total one hundred the origin of the deerhound seems to be shrouded in mystery the writer has owned and bred deerhounds for over thirty years and has during that time read everything relating to them that he could obtain he has closely questioned every scotchman whom he has met concerning this breed of dogs the history given in books has always proved contradictory and of no avail while every well-informed scotchman has argued that the deerhound was the native dog of the scottish highlands and that all other scotch dogs were merely the result of crosses of the deerhound on some alien they always point to the rough coats of the collie the terrier and the scotch greyhound and say don't it show for itself that the remote cross is there yet the question as to the real origin of the breed is still a mystery and probably will always remain so up to eighteen sixty deerhounds were not plentiful in england and but few were exhibited at english shows for some years after that date america at that time had but few scotchmen informed me however that in the highlands of scotland they were always plentiful but owners of kennels cherished them sold none and gave away but few 
it was some years after the above date that inquiries for them began to be frequent and since then they have become immensely popular with lovers of the chase and are rapidly advancing to a high place as companions for both gentlemen and ladies of late years certain sportsmen in the great west have secured many fine specimens breeding it is presumed that the breeder owns his stud dog and brood bitches and hence my directions will be applied to both all dogs of the high nervous organization of the hound require a large amount of exercise to keep them in proper muscular development therefore i would advise only persons who live in the open country to try the breeding of the scotch deerhound this breed cannot bear confinement in close quarters it is safe to say that the two prominent breeders in america do not raise one out of ten puppies whelped in their kennels this is largely owing to lack of proper conditioning of sire and dam in selecting a brood bitch take one with strong loin and roomy chest not under two years old for two months before she is due in season give her from ten to fifteen miles of regular slow exercise behind a horse to properly muscle a deerhound it is not necessary to give her much fast work let her follow a carriage through the country or if you live on a farm let her follow the farm team around every day feed well at night so that she will have all the night in which to digest her food if your work is slow she will take it every day and gradually develop muscle and vigorous health the eye will become clear and large the muscle hard and firm the constitution vigorous the step elastic and the courage great if you can now give her a race or two to fully open her bronchial tubes and thus develop full chest power it will be well if she is now coming in season exercise her until she is ready for service and then let her have complete rest for two or three days before the dog is allowed to serve her the stud dog of course should have had the same treatment and hence be in perfect condition if so one service will be better than more and if either are out of condition you had better not breed them after service the dog can take his rest but the brood bitch should be left alone for a week and then be put back at the same work and worked slowly but daily until the seventh week then stop her work and let her rest feeding well this brings us up to her whelping time if on a farm let her hunt her own place to whelp in she will generally find a good location and bring forth a large litter of strong healthful puppies allow no stranger to disturb her during the first week some brood bitches are exceedingly nervous and if disturbed will become restless get up and turn over frequently trying to cover up their whelps thus they are liable to lie on them and kill them if you have such a bitch it is best to prepare a kennel for her to whelp in this should be made roomy and along the sides a strip should be nailed four inches wide and four inches from the floor for bedding tack carpet on the floor so she cannot cover up her puppies and then lie on them this board along the side of the kennel will give the puppies a chance to crawl under also behind the dam while she cannot get on them if the weather be warm it will be well to have nothing but the board floor for them to lie on if it be cold it will be well to remove the carpet in four or five days and give a bed of clean straw which should be changed twice a week the writer prefers to have a bitch whelp on nice clean dry earth it acts as a disinfectant and puppies always have done better and have been less liable to disease when whelped and raised on an earthen bed i have during my experience of over thirty years in breeding and rearing deerhounds made it a rule never to feed the dam until she comes out of her kennel after food and then to give her some nice soup and scraps of cooked meat beef or mutton being preferable she is now required to supply milk freely and her diet must be strong and of good quality and quantity give her different kinds of food oatmeal cooked meats bread vegetables of different kinds sprats cod liver oil biscuit raw meat and plenty of bones to gnaw at many writers and breeders say never to let a dam raise more than six or seven whelps 
my experience is that if you help a good mother she will raise eight or ten just as well as five or six and much better than if she has no help with the smaller number puppies at three weeks old will begin to eat soup and should have it four or five times daily at four weeks old they will eat cod liver oil cake softened in strong beef or mutton soup and should have it three times daily all they will eat always keep your feeding pans sweet and clean when you feed the puppies remain with them until they are done eating then take away what they leave give it to the dam and wash your feeding pan so it will be clean when next wanted under such treatment you will notice that the dam has very little trouble with her litter and she will not begin to grow fat at six or seven weeks of age her puppies will be weaned she will have raised ten just as easily as she would have raised five and if they are bred for sale it makes a vast difference in the income many people say that deerhound puppies are exceedingly hard to raise i have never found it so give them plenty of exercise and good food and they will raise themselves anywhere and in any climate it is well to give puppies once a month a dose of santonine to clear out any worms they may have i have never lost a puppy with distemper and have always made it a rule to have them in good condition at all times then when distemper has taken hold of them they have usually had but a slight attack and have gone through it in good shape i have never yet seen a deerhound that was afflicted with chorea training I do not believe in early training, and hence have never worked or prepared a deerhound under twelve to fifteen months old. My experience is that the breed develops slowly, and for this reason a puppy at nine months old is not strong enough to follow a deer in any of our American forests. A carefully reared puppy can, at nine or ten months old, be given slow work behind the saddle horse or carriage. This should continue for at least two months and if three months can be given to this conditioning work it will prove all the better while a puppy is growing rapidly and filling out he takes on muscle slowly and for this reason his exercise should be continued for a longer period than is necessary for old dogs the deerhound is used for hunting the deer in the western country in two entirely different ways and for each the training must be distinct and precise according to the way he is to hunt his game one is still hunting the other is coursing the deer for still hunting the deerhound is the dog par excellence in training a puppy to still hunt take him on a leash and with a snap so arranged that he can be loosened instantly it is well to show him the game before firing and at the first move of the puppy let him go if the deer be only wounded he will follow it and if from the right kind of sire and dam he will catch and kill the deer if his family connections have been of the timid kind he will bay the wounded deer and you can follow and kill it but if his ancestors have been used on game and your puppy is strong and of good age he will kill the first deer he sees just as a well-bred setter will point the first quail he scents after a few lessons your puppy will stay to heal until you shoot without a leash and as he grows older he will frequently lead you to the game by his keen scent merely sniffing the air as he cautiously proceeds by your side or just in front of you of course it is necessary to teach him obedience and not to allow him to break away should this occur he will soon be coursing the deer and leave you many miles behind then his lessons must begin again at the leash if carefully done his teaching will be easy and he will soon stand with the game in full view and not move a muscle but will quiver with excitement every muscle and nerve on extreme tension waiting for his master to fire when he is away with the speed of a falcon for coursing the deer antelope wolf and coyote the deerhound is much used throughout the far west for this purpose they are generally used in packs of from three to ten a good courser will begin the preparation of his dogs by the first of august so that when the weather gets cool enough for them to bear hard and fast running say in october they will be in prime condition hard in muscle in strong good health and eager for the sport 
it is not necessary to train a deerhound for coursing all that is needed here is to show him the game and turn him loose it is always best to take a puppy out with one or more older dogs who will take hold of any kind of game and thus educate the puppy to seize and kill the game he is running the only proper way to course deer antelope wolves or coyotes is to have a cage on a light vehicle for the purpose of confining the dogs and keeping them at rest until you sight your game then drive as close to it as possible so that your dogs will be fresh when the game starts if this is not done you will soon find that a jaded tired dog cannot catch a fresh deer antelope wolf or coyote i have frequently coursed deer and antelopes on the western plains by taking out six good dogs in a cage on a light wagon and several friends following on good running horses the cage was so arranged that the driver could pull a spring open the door and let out the three loose dogs for a run while the three to be retained in the cage were chained to the floor or sides by driving in such a direction that it would appear to the game as though the wagon would pass by about two hundred yards away and then angling toward the game i could often approach within one hundred and fifty yards before they would start and the moment the game would throw up their heads the driver would pull the spring door and out would come the loose dogs and away would go game dogs and horsemen the wagon coming along to pick up the game and tired dogs the latter would then be given water put back in the cage and chained and the three fresh dogs would next be slipped one day of such work where the game is plentiful will educate any well-bred young deer hound preparing for the bench requires an entirely different course of treatment after your dog is in good condition up to that point the work may be of a similar nature he should be brushed and combed daily and well hand rubbed so that his muscular development will be prominent to the touch teach him to romp and play with you while you have a collar and leash on him this will ensure gay carriage in the judge's ring and when you have a deerhound with his eye bright head up and tail properly carried if otherwise equal he will always win over a sulky drooping cheerless dog i have always had better success in the ring and in the field with dogs of my own rearing than with those reared by others they are always more tractable and more ready to obey my wishes and much more cheerful than those purchased after they are grown the latter always act for me as though they were looking for a lost friend my advice is to rear your own dogs that they may know no other master than yourself the memory of the deerhound seems to surpass that of any other breed except the greyhound i have sold old dogs and have not seen them for two years and without seeing me they would at once recognize my whistle when they heard it and would come bounding to me in perfect ecstasy of delight how much longer they would have remembered me i cannot say but doubtless for many years coursing the deerhound thirty-four years ago in the blue mountain range of pennsylvania i began this sport in the spring of eighteen fifty six a scotchman a watchmaker by trade located in the little village of lehigh gap he brought with him two deerhounds a dog and a bitch after a short residence at the gap he had to go back to scotland and left his horse and two dogs with me until he should return the next spring he never returned and i became the owner of a fine horse and two excellent deerhounds i hunted those dogs after foxes lynx wildcats and deer until worn out by old age and hard work they would run with a pack of foxhounds that were kept in the vicinity as though trained with them from birth they would trail with them and whenever the fox appeared in a field they would at once leave the pack run by sight and catch the fox there was no sport that they enjoyed more the ease with which a deerhound may be educated to do a certain part of any sport is remarkable in a portion of the pocoivo mountains north of the blue range deer were at that time plentiful much of the country is very rough and it was impossible for the deerhounds to catch a deer that was not wounded so we used to take a pair of slow trail hounds to drive the deer into and across the valleys 
and would then take the deer hounds into the valleys to sight the deer as they came out the second time we went there with our dogs was in november eighteen fifty six we arrived about daylight and our trail dogs struck a track and gave tongue before we had our team unhitched from the wagon while we were putting out the team the deer hounds got away from us and we supposed they had followed the yelping trail hounds we ran to the valley below some half mile away as fast as we could knowing that the game would cross there when we got within sight of the runway to our great astonishment we found beavis and leda at their posts eager for a sight of the game when i say that on our previous hunt one month earlier we had always kept collar and leash on these dogs and that they caught on that hunt but two deer at this point the remarkable sagacity of the deerhound may be realized had the foxhound started on a trail in the blue mountains the deerhounds would have gone with them to catch the fox but not so here they had been here once on entirely different business and so well did they remember it that they immediately sped to their posts of duty and well did they perform their work the deer came out close to them and they caught and killed it before it ran two hundred yards the dog beavis was the only deerhound i ever saw that was trained to do tricks of various kinds he would fetch carry go to the post office or butcher shop carry notes to neighbors and take back anything that was given him in return for the letter i remember distinctly that he once did a trick never before required of him i was driving a fractious horse in a sulky and dropped my whip i was afraid to get out to regain it and called to beavis to pick it up which he did immediately then i called him to bring it which he also did and placed it in my hand i was then a schoolboy and took great pains to teach this dog something i never had the time nor patience in after life to repeat with any of my other dogs i now remember many fine specimens that have often displayed intelligence of a superior order which needed nothing but training and teaching to make them trick dogs i fully believe that a properly shaped deerhound could be educated for high leaping so as to surpass all dogs in that work a strong short-backed powerfully muscled deerhound leaps easier and higher than any other dog that i have ever seen in the field no doubt it is only the high price that keeps them from getting into the hands of training showmen who would otherwise bring them forward in this amusing novelty to illustrate their jumping power i will relate an amusing incident which happened several years ago in a western village my dog imported champion mac delighted in killing all the cats he could find while on a wolf hunt we were just starting out in the early morning and the dogs feeling extra fresh mac came up a cross street after a cat the cat went under our horses and mac in a tremendous leap went over both horses this dog never had any special training in leaping but when after game he was never known to stop at any obstruction that could be scaled the courage and game qualities of the high-bred deerhound cannot be better illustrated than by describing a wolf hunt that took place in montana some years since i sold a trained pack of six deerhounds to the sun river hound club of montana this club was composed of wealthy cattlemen who were losing thousands of dollars worth of cattle annually through the ravages of the large gray timber wolf they hired mr i n porter an experienced wolf hunter to handle this pack of deerhounds on their cattle range for one year i had guaranteed the dogs to kill any wolf in the territory mr porter took the dogs with him to deliver them to the club he and the writer had killed many prairie wolves in the colorado with these dogs but had never tackled the large gray timber wolves of the rocky mountains it seems that one of the members of this club had a large flock of sheep and one certain wolf had been preying on them for four years past it was to this ranch that mr porter and the dogs were first taken and this tremendous wolf was to be the first one that the pack was to tackle if they could catch and kill him my guarantee was to be considered fulfilled i had carefully instructed mr porter how to work the dogs and above all to have them in prime condition when they saw the first wolf this ranch was located some seventy-five miles from railroad communication and the dogs had to travel this distance on foot so that when they arrived at their future home 
their feet were worn to the quick and they had to be rested the second night after their arrival this wolf with two smaller ones came and killed four sheep and naturally mr porter's curiosity was aroused to see what kind of animal these dogs were to kill so after daylight he mounted his horse and followed the wolves merely to get sight of them and learn their habits the following is quoted from a letter which was written on his return to the house after seeing this large wolf dear doctor the dogs and i arrived safe only very sore from long travel these men are very anxious to see what kind of work these high-priced dogs will do last night that big wolf they wrote you about killed four sheep near the house and i followed him five or six miles merely to see what he looked like i saw him and i want to tell you now that i think my job and your dog money will be gone whenever i allow the dogs to go near that wolf but i can't hold these men much longer so i promise to go after him day after tomorrow two days later i received the following letter dear doctor last night or rather just before daylight we heard the wolf in the sheep corral and went out to scare him away he had already killed one sheep and eaten of it freely at daylight myself and three club members took four of the dogs oscar and meta still too sore to work and started after the big fellow we followed him for at least ten miles before we could show him to the dogs they went to him very quickly he depending more on his fighting than running qualities Colonel and Dan reached him first, and struck him with such force that he went down, never to get up again. They killed him in a short time, and neither of the dogs got a scratch. The colonel took his old hold at the throat, and never let go until I choked him off. Colonel, you know, is just thirty inches high at the shoulder. We stood this wolf up beside Colonel, and he was one inch taller than the dog we brought the wolf home to see what he would weigh and he tipped the beam at one hundred and seven pounds to say that the club members were delighted with the dogs is putting it too mild they were simply crazed dan was still sore in his feet and they carried him home on horseback i will now rest the dogs up and get them in perfect form before i work them again this country is alive with wolves and other game during the season of eighteen eighty six Mr. Porter killed with these dogs 148 gray wolves and over 300 coyotes. Among many letters from him extolling the wonderful courage of these grand dogs, the following shows what six dogs, well trained to their work, can do. Dear Doctor, Today I suddenly came upon a pack of fifteen full-grown wolves. I had all six dogs with me, and they were in good form i was satisfied that unless we did good work and that quickly the wolves would kill the dogs so i jumped among them and as fast as the dogs got one down i stuck my knife into his heart in this way we killed twelve out of the fifteen but i am sorry to say that poor old faithful courageous dick was killed if there is a breed of dogs on earth that combines so many sterling qualities as the scotch deerhound i am not acquainted with that breed. End of section eight.